birthday, 30th of June 2021. Coming to you live from our studio in Nigeria. This is Breakfast Central. Yes, indeed, it is the 30th day in the month of June 2021. Officially, this is the very last day in the month of June. And it's an honor to have you join us on Breakfast Central, reaching you live from our Lagos studio. Orukomi Ni Oluchi Inabong. And I'm Olisa Chukuma. Good morning, Africa. We are set to bring you news, top stories, and the latest uh, from across the African continent and beyond. Now, before we bring you all that headlines, let's uh, say quickly, and today, yes, the 30th day of June, which is Independence Day out there in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, a national day for DRC marked by its independence from Belgium back in 1960, uh, this day, June the 30th. So big congratulations to our brothers and sisters in the DRC and happy Independence Day. Now, let's bring you our headlines for today, June 30th, it's a Wednesday, 2021. We'll start in South Africa, where Jacob Zuma gets 15 months jail term. And we'll be telling you all about Nandi Kanu, his arrest and his arraignment in Abuja court. Uh, it, well, UN expresses concern over the Tigray region, the crisis there. And we'll be taking a look at the newspapers that we have for you today. Plus, uh, updates when it comes to COVID-19 as it affects Africa, all that and more on the program, Breakfast Central. All right, we'll begin the breakfast show this morning with a review of the major newspaper headlines. And the very first one we start, we're having this morning is from the southwestern part of Africa, looking at Nigeria, and that is the Punch newspaper this morning. And looking at the Punch, um, we have electricity subsidy gulps 30 billion naira per month, uh, says the federal government on page 32 of the Punch this morning. Petrol should be more than 280 naira per litre. Mm. Ah, says wow. who? Says Yari, oh. page 27 of the paper this morning. Also, the very big, bold one we have here. Uh, they're talking about 18 judges. It says, EFCC fraud cases, 1,000 others to start afresh. Five of my cases will start afresh, EFCC counsel says. Uh, judge handling 2006 case afresh should be promoted. You have all of this on the front page of the punch this morning. Also, looking at a picture there, you have uh, the Benway State Governor. Yeah, that's him there. Within one of the school premises. Now, this is an Arabic primary and secondary school in McCordy. Uh, I think the school has been refurbished. Yes, you can see the before photos and the after photos. The before photos, they were sitting on the floor. Um, you can see that they barely have anything to use to even write. And you can see the ceiling, um, really pretty, pretty much dilapidated. But right now, that school has been upgraded. More details from The Punch this morning. All right, quickly, we go down south to the Sowetan in South Africa, one of my favorite papers. And there you have it from the big news yesterday. No one but the law is supreme. It says, as Concord ruling, widely hated for it, as it asserts uh, that ruling. So it's uh, uh, clock ticking for former president, the embattled one, I love to call him, Jacob Zuma, uh, to start serving his 15-month jail term for contempt of courts after the Zondo Commission antics. So uh, that will be one of the stories we're following this morning. 15-month jail term handed to former president Jacob Zuma in South Africa. Plus, also at the top there, Suwetan, where is Swatini? Yes, as Swatini burns, they're asking the whereabouts of uh, their monarch there. And there's uh, still no place for expelled um, matriculants. All of that on the front page. Plus, there's a coach here of Kaiser Chiefs. Coach Arthur deserves top job at Kaiser Chiefs, says uh, more on that on the back page. And inside the Sowetan in South Africa. Right, moving on from South Africa, we have Uganda looking at the Daily Monitor in Uganda. And the paper is talking all about COVID. 
uh, one of the major major story here says registration for covid money kicks off today uh, suggested budget for 21 days you have the different ingredients you need to have in your house maize flour cooking oil beans laundry soap and others that you should get uh, that's what it said in the papers now some of the beneficiaries of this items it says here um, bus and taxi drivers as well as conductors different sectors in the walk of life from um, the uganda paper you have it there this morning from the daily monitor talking about registration for covid money kicks off today also in the paper treating covid why government cleared covidex drug you also have that in the paper this morning and a very sad one from a parent to the children i spread covid to my children it says here in the paper from the daily monitor this morning all right i'm still in the south of the continent so i'm moving from south africa to zimbabwe with the daily news uh and oh, it looks like they follow it was south africa going for lockdown and it says ed that's massima gagwa uh the president of the country zimbabwe effects dusk to dawn curfew as COVID deaths infections uh, keep surging in Zimbabwe. So there you have it from the president. It means that they will be going into a curfew in Zimbabwe to curb the infections and the spread of COVID-19. Plus also, uh, they're not missing what's going on in their next door neighbors. SA, South Africa holds breath as Zuma is jailed. All that and more on the front page of the Daily News in Zimbabwe. All right, and that's all we have in the newspaper headlines for you today, the 30th of June, 2021. It is now time for our top stories. And we start off in Ethiopia, where the United Nations humanitarians have expressed concern at the uncertain situation in Ethiopia's conflict-ravaged Tigray region, despite the ceasefire call from the government. Now, this is also highlighting the ongoing famine-like conditions there and the potential for disease outbreaks. Now, after nearly eight months of heavy fighting, the development uh, follows uh, Monday's reported entry into the regional capital of uh, the uh, Tigray, that's Mikele, of forces loyal to the opposition. Now, meanwhile, the World Health Organization spokesperson, that's Tariq Yasserovich, uh, says the UN agency was taking measures to reinforce staff security and well being. Come in, uh, UNHCR is extremely worried about the latest developments inside Tigray, particularly in the capital, Mikele. While we are thankful that our staff are all safe and accounted for. We are concerned about the lack of communication as both electrical power and phone networks uh, are not functioning. This is making it even more difficult for our staff to work and deliver humanitarian assistance. We call for calm and restraint and appeal to all parties to the conflict to abide by international law, to protect civilians, including people who have been displaced, and to ensure that humanitarian workers can continue to exercise their duties and reach as many people as they can, which are in need of vital assistance right now. We, from our side of WHO, we are taking measures to strengthen the security and well-being of our staff. But at the same time, we are continuing to deliver activities where it, it is possible to do so. And these includes activities in IDP camps around surveillance and access to essential health care and increasing the number of mobile health clinics. We are obviously concerned about potential uh, for cholera, measles and malaria outbreaks in the region. In addition, Tigray region is also located in the meningitis belt and it is at the risk of a yellow fever outbreak. Right, let's go to the big news in South Africa. Yesterday, there's been mixed reactions in the country uh, after former President Jacob Zuma received a 15-month jail term after being found guilty of contempt of court. Now, Zuma was sentenced yesterday after he failed to appear before the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector in February this year. Now, his defiance came despite a constitutional court order for him not to go before the commission. Now, supporters of the former president have said the judgment is unacceptable and even unconstitutional. Now, the country's struggle uh, veterans have said that they will protect Zuma. 
from arrest. But the cohorts of citizens have welcomed the judgment, saying it showed that all are equal before the Constitution and the law. All right, let's take you to that moment, yes, in South Africa, where the ruling was delivered against Jacob Zuma. In the final analysis, the Constitutional Court makes the following order. One, the application for direct access is granted. Two, the Helen Sussman Foundation is admitted as amicus curiae. Three, it is declared that Mr. Jacob Gevehle Gisazuma is guilty of the crime of contempt of court for failure to comply with the order made by this court in Secretary of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state versus Jacob Gevehle Gisazuma. Mr. Jacob for Mr. Jacob Gevehle Gisazuma is sentenced to undergo 15 months imprisonment. Five, Mr. Jacob Gevehle Gisazuma is ordered to submit himself to the South African police at Nkandla police station or Johannesburg Central police station within five calendar, calendar days from the date of this order for the station commander or other officer in charge of that police station to ensure that he is immediately de delivered to a correctional center to commence serving the sentence imposed in paragraph four. Six, in the event that Mr. Jacob Gevehle Gisazuma does not submit himself to the South African Police Service as required by paragraph five, the Minister of Police and the National Commissioner of the South African Police Service must within three calendar days of the expiry of the period stipulated in paragraph five, take all steps that are necessary and permissible in law to ensure that Mr. Jacob Gelehle Gisazuma is delivered to a correctional center in order to commence serving the sentence imposed in paragraph four. All right, so there you heard it first. Uh, Jacob Zuma is sentenced to 15 months in prison uh, for contempt of court. So he's got five days to submit himself to the uh, police. Well, the uh, clock is ticking as it may. Well, joining us this morning to really look at this is political analyst Tessa Dooms to unpack some of the reactions in South Africa following this ruling yesterday. Tessa, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast Central. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Tessa. Now, tell us generally, what's the sentiment among the citizenry about this sentence that has been handed down to a former president, first of its kind, in South Africa? Yeah, um, as expected, given the nature of um, Jacob Zuma's, not, not only his time as president in the country, but even the subsequent years, um, this is a divisive verdict and it's a divisive moment in our country. Um, you have not only internal um, party political factions um, that emerged from the ANC starting as far back as 2017, when President Cyril Ramaphosa emerged as the ANC president over um, who, who was the former president's uh, preferred candidate in Kosozana Dlamini Zuma at the time. And so from that point onwards, you had emerging factions within the ANC, where you have people who were um, who felt that the president, um, the former president at, that, uh, at this point, was being targeted by the party and targeted by people in civil society and other um, spheres of business and so on. And so you, you have a lot of protection of Jacob Zuma and a lot of support for Jacob Zuma, not only in the ANC, but also in um, the community around him in the province that he's from. But on the other hand, you also have a lot of people who, number one, supported the removal of Jacob Zuma as president um, a few years ago, and people who believe that this kind of verdict does show that politicians can be held to account, particularly in a country where we're dealing with large-scale corruption issues like the state capture inquiry at the moment, and where we're seeing politician after politician being um, outed for being involved in some kind of corrupt activity. This does give some sense that the law is working as it should. The question is, is our politics ready to deal with the weight of the law? All right, uh, uh, Tessa, this is quite a landmark one. Uh, you just pointed out that he's got lots of support in South Africa. People are saying, you know, this perhaps a witch hunt uh, uh, politically, but uh, he's not getting jail term for the crimes he's been accused of, state capture, 
corruption fraud. He's getting sentenced uh, for contempt of court for not showing up for the crimes he's been uh, accused of. So walk us through the other process, which is the case itself against Jacob Zuma, because this is uh, basically 15 months. But what about the case, uh, the case about corruption against him, which is still ongoing, as it were? Well, actually, um, the case that is um, currently before the court is a case that's not about his term as president, which is what the state capture inquiry is about. Um, it's actually a, a case that dates back um, to the early 2000s and the arms deal, where a, um, a, an associate of his, Shabir Sheikh, who was already found guilty many years ago of corrupt activities that involved the then deputy president, Jacob Zuma. He was at that point removed as deputy president by Dabun Betty, who was president at the time. And uh, because his associate, associate was found guilty of corruption that involved him, there was, of course, always this pending um, set of allegations and charges against him for those corrupt activities almost 20 years ago. And so this case that he is in front of court for um, is actually a longstanding one. But what we are seeing today is not actually linked to any corruption um, case. It is linked to the state capture inquiry, which is not a legal um, you know, court of law. It is a um, judicial inquiry that's led by a judge, but it does not have, it, at that point, it would not have um, legal implications for him appearing. Um, whatever he said, they would not be necessarily directly about whether he would go to jail or not. We are, very, we are a few steps away from that in terms of the state capture and the Gupta allegations. But this is actually a first um, time that he's been held accountable before a court of law for anything corruption related or not. And I think that's what's important here, that politicians, whether these crimes are big or small, can be held accountable. Right. Now, looking at this, this is the first of its kind, like we said, and South Africa has joined some other African countries, Nigeria exclusive, um, to have actually imprisoned or sentenced a former president uh, to jail, countries like South, um, Sudan and even Algeria. But looking at it on the flip side, can we call this victory for democracy or is it even too soon to tell? I think it is a little bit too soon to tell for two reasons. One is that we don't know whether or not the former president is actually going to comply and willingly go um, in the next four days now and submit himself to the law. If he does not, we do know that there are a lot of people who already, especially within the, the ANC, what we call the, um, the MK Veterans League within the ANC, who are saying that they are willing to make sure that the president does not end up in jail and does not submit himself to the law. And I think that could be particularly dangerous and testing for our democracy, because we will see citizens putting themselves on the line for a political matter against the law. And I think that could be a dangerous moment. If the president does go through with it and he does submit himself to the law, that will be a win for democracy. We must also remember that that 15 months could be as short as two and a half months because in South African law, you would be eligible for parole um, about a sixth into your prison term. So that would be about two and a half months um, actually in prison if he is given parole. So there would also be questions about, is he going to be given any special treatment? Um, will that parole become perhaps a medical parole based on his age? And I think those kinds of things are going to be in the public discourse and people are going to be evaluating our democracy and whether or not this idea that we are all equal before the law is actually going to play itself out all the way through or this judgment is going to be a momentary win and then we're just going to see um, the political elite do what they do and evade the full consequences of the law. All right, thank you so much, uh, Tessa Doom, for giving us you know, a bit of a breakdown. So we'll have to watch in the coming days to see if there will be mm -hmm. compliance yeah. from Zuma, but history doesn't really say so in that sense. Thank you very much, Tessa Dooms, once again, for coming on Breakfast Central. Right, uh, still more top stories right here on Breakfast Central. Still watching Breakfast Central. Quickly now, we segue to West Africa, Nigeria. Coming home, if you may. Now, the Nigerian government has announced the arrest of the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Grafra, Ipob, a name of Namdi Kanu. Now, the disclosure was made by the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, at a joint press briefing uh, with the heads of Department of Security Services and the police.
Now, he said that Namdi Kano was apprehended by security agencies and brought back to Nigeria on Sunday. Namdi Kano, who has been on the run after jumping bail, was arraigned before Justice Binta Iyako of the Federal High Court Abuja and placed in the custody of the Department of State Services. Claimed leader of the proscribed secessionist indigenous people of Yafara, Namdi Kanu has, for your information, been intercepted through the collaborative efforts of the Nigerian intelligence and security services. He has been brought back to Nigeria in order to continue facing trial after this affair while on bail regarding 11 count charge against him. Recent steps taken by the federal government so to the interception of the fugitive Kanu on Sunday, the 27th day of June 2021. Kanu is as at now being produced before federal high court in continuation of hearing of his case in respect of which he has evaded and indeed jumped bail. All right, so there you have it uh, from uh, Minister of Justice Malami giving the briefing in the, uh, in the media yesterday about the arrest, interception, and arraignment of Nandi Kano. Now, while joined by a political analyst and security expert, Dr. Ona, who returns back on Breakfast Central this morning. Dr. Ona, welcome back uh, to Breakfast Central. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, sir. Good morning Dr. Ona. Now, let's get your reactions on the rearrest of Nandi Kano, who fled the country way back in 2017 while on bill. What are your own sentiments? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think uh, it's a very positive development. Um, uh, it, well, it shows many things. It shows that um, our law enforcement agencies are capable of, uh, you know, making certain things happen. For example, uh, re-arresting uh, fleeing uh, fugitives. And uh, it shows also that uh, the international policing system does work. Uh, because certainly uh, he was uh, seized by uh, with the help of um, Interpol. And um, it shows also that when the government uh, is really after some actor, some uh, perpetrator out there, they, they, if there is focus, they are able to achieve something. So I think um, it's a very positive development. Um, I have uh, quite... I've been quite concerned with the activities of uh, uh, the Mr. Kanu and uh, stoking violence in Nigeria while he's hiding overseas um, and, uh, you know, starting this uh, great secessionist movement. Uh, I mean, uh, it's fine uh, if, he, if he wants to succeed, uh, succeed, but he shouldn't uh, ask people to be burning uh, uh, police stations, killing policemen and seizing their weapons. That is... Uh, that is a, that is terrorism. There's nothing more. Just like what the Fulani headsmen and the bandits do, and uh, Boko Haram is all the same. That is terrorism. And so uh, I, I think um, the uh, uh, what is it called? The getting uh, a hold of this guy to come and face justice. Uh, well, also, I, sorry. The fifth point it proves is that the when you are uh, on trial and you are granted bail, please come back and. Uh, conclude your trial, uh, because uh, if you jump bail, uh, you could uh, be uh, seized just like this guy has been seized. So I think it's a, a, a very good day for the law enforcement authorities in Nigeria. It's a good day for the federal government. It shows that we are not just um, uh, a government for sure. We are a government with action. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, Justice Malami pointed out in that uh, media briefing yesterday that it was a joint collaboration between the intelligence services and security operatives. Now, before we get uh, to the uh, next uh, point here, uh, let's listen to what the counsel to Inam De Kano himself, Marshal Abubakar, had to say about the arrest of his uh, client and the trial. Well, Inam De Kano was uh, brought to court today. Uh, we witnessed they bringing him to court today, officials of the DSS and the Nigerian police, they were the combined team. He was brought to court today, and we're here where they brought him. I saw him in hood and handcuffs and then leg chains. We're urging the government and urging the Nigerian states to ensure that all the rights 
of Mr. Unam Dekano are respected as regards his trial. The trial will kick start again starting from 26th of July 2021. We'll be here to see that all uh, the paraphernalia, all the, all the requirements of a fair trial, which is a sacred constitutional requirement entrenched in Section 36 of the Nigerian National Constitution, are complied and strictly adhered to. All right, uh, that was the marshal, uh, one of the legal counsel for Nambikanu. And this brings or uh, begs a lot of questions that Nigerians and even people in diaspora are asking. Now, Kanu has been accused of instigating violence, especially in the southeastern part of Nigeria, which resulted in the loss of lives, properties of civilians, destruction of civ civil institutions, and symbols of authority. The question we're asking Dr. Ono right now is, do you see him getting a fair trial uh, with the way the rule of the law He's, it's been um, carried out in Nigeria. Do you think it will be followed in this, his case in particular? Well, um, I, I think uh, it is better for him to get a trial than to get a bullet in the head. Um, uh, having said that, I mean, what I mean by that is uh, it's better for him to be put on trial than to be killed extrajudicially. And uh, I'm happy that uh, they didn't uh, do that. Uh, he has counsel. Mr. Abubakar that is representing him, uh, he will have his day in court. He will state uh, why he did what he did. And it's an open court. It might be that uh, he might uh, adduce evidence that might uh, exonerate him. And, uh, or maybe even there is a technicality, since Nigerian judiciary has now become uh, notorious for technicalities. Uh, perhaps uh, there might be a technicality that will enable uh, the judiciary uh, grant him freedom. Um, uh, and he might make a, a good case, who knows? So, but I, I think, uh, yes, I, I, well, I think he, he he is better off with the court system than uh, if he had been uh, killed or poisoned or whatever, uh, you know, happens to uh, people out there sometimes. Um, I think he's better off um, uh, being tried and let him have his day in court and uh, let uh, people see what he has to say mm. uh, about um, why he engaged in what he did and uh, his justification and perhaps uh, if he has enough uh, proof, evidence to uh, exonerate himself. Well, at least, Dr. Now we, we're seeing a swift, uh, you know, judicial process, which is arrest, you know, and arraignment in the Abuja court. So looks like we're going to be moving fast with this one uh, legally in this country. But his arrest uh, can be, has been seen by many perhaps as a big blow uh, to all the Biafra movement and talks and uh, you know, sentiments. While we hear that the Northern Coalition uh, for Northern Groups are calling for a referendum. Uh, do you share that sentiment? Is it, will this be perhaps... Uh, uh, the beginning of the end uh, for the Brafian sentiments and uh, with their leader now appearing in courts, whatever technicalities that may happen in courts, you know, so to speak. Well, um, I'm not, I'm more of a security analyst than a political analyst. I'm not uh, too much into politics. I, I think uh, if you ask me, uh, I don't agree with secessionist movements. I think uh, they are wrong headed, wherever they may be, whether they are Biafra, whether they are Ututua whether they are middle belt, whether they are northern, whatever. I think they are wrong-headed. Uh, there are problems in the Nigerian state, in the Nigerian polity. We have serious political problems. We have economic problems. We have security problems in this country, which deserve serious uh, tackling and uh, resolution. Uh, all these um, uh, secessionist movements, are they don't have, I mean, I have said before many times that the the uh, uh, the leadership, the political leadership of the East uh, is not, ha has not signed on on the uh, uh, secessionist movement. So this is a rogue operation. Mm. So I, I really don't think that um, this had any chance of going anywhere uh, as it were. So I don't see it as a big blow. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hunger in the land. There's a lot of joblessness. And so when somebody is somewhere there stoking violence, and uh, people don't have anything to do. They they sign on eventually because, uh, in fact, the constituted political authority. I'm talking about the governors and the local government chairman. And in fact, even the national government. They are not doing what they are supposed to do in terms of uh, providing um, 
a means uh, that is providing for the welfare, let's put it that way, going by uh, Section 14.2B of the Constitution, uh, providing the welfare of the citizens. So that's how come uh, it is possible for through radio and through TV and through online messaging for right. uh, some rogue figure like this to get uh, into the living room or into the hearts of some young people. And actually, the dangerous thing now, not just talking to them, actually moving some people to take action. All and right. that is really, really dangerous. Well, yeah. well, thank you once again, Dr. Ona Okome, for coming on Breakfast Central. Always such a delight to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Right, you're still watching Breakfast Central on News Central. Now, several countries across Africa have been experiencing a third wave of the coronavirus pandemic, which is being exacerbated by the spread of the highly trans transmissible uh, Delta variant. Now, last week, the World Health Organization reported that Africa is facing its steepest COVID-19 surge, yet with uh, close to 500,000 infections in its third wave uh, alone. Now, what does this spike mean for Nigeria? New Central is partnering with the uh, Conservation Africa, yes, uh, Nigeria Info FM and Punch Media Foundation to discuss Nigeria's response to the pandemic and just how prepared we are for the next pandemic. Now, joining us this morning to discuss Nigeria and the next pandemic is uh, Dr. Donyi uh, Tubanjo, who is the Executive Director of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences. Uh, good morning, Dr. Odubanjo. Welcome to Breakfast Central. Thank you very much. Good morning. morning. Good morning, Doctor. Now, in terms of uh, the third wave of COVID-19 in Africa, where is Nigeria in the midst of all of this? Uh, that's, that's a serious question, uh, trying to locate Nigeria. Uh, but let me, let, I'll say two things in that regard. One is that uh, testing, you know, seems to be 40 or should I say wobbling. Uh, and we had 65 new cases reported yesterday from just a few states, very few states. And today we have 11. So uh, we're testing and the figures, so to speak, are rather haphazard as that. It's difficult to say where we stand. You know, it's difficult to say we are doing well, we're out of the woods, we're not, it's increasing, it's decreasing. Very difficult to say. Uh, so a second answer to that, you know, where are we in Nigeria? is to say that when you see the fire burning in your neighbor's house, uh, then watch out because yours might be next, you know. So it means that we, we need to be careful. We need to wake up. We need to realize that this is not over yet, you know. So people talk these days and they say, oh, when we were in the pandemic. No, no, no. You know, so it's still on. Uh, and basically that's what we need to, uh, that's where we are. We, we, need, we need to know that the issue is still on, the pandemic is still on, and uh, we have to be on guard. All right, Dr. Doina, looking at the pandemic outside of the third wave, uh, how, in your opinion, has uh, Nigeria been handling the response uh, to COVID-19 so far? You just talked about uh, testing. Well, beyond testing, there's vaccination and also, uh, you know, social distancing and this new pandemic living that we've been experiencing. Well, relatively, we, we are, we're struggling. <laughs> That's the honest opinion. We're struggling. Uh, relatively, some people will say we, we've done well, uh, but that that uh, is a is a function of a multiple um, of multiple factors you know which is including some strategy yes uh, some luck yes some divine intervention yes um, you know so it's it's a it, it's a potpourri of factors that have uh, brought us so far there are things we have done right and uh, there are many things also we have not done right and the idea is that and, and I think that's the idea of the uh, event to speak speak about you know what Nigeria has done, the lessons to be learned, um, so that we don't keep repeating the same errors. You know, so I, I wouldn't say we've we, we've done very well. I would just say yeah, we've survived. So whatever we've done, uh, somehow has managed to see us uh, to a good place relatively. Uh, however, we should not take that as an endorsement and beat our chest and say we're just fantastic. Uh, we should rather sit back and look at it and say, well, maybe we got away just luckily and uh, we need to do better next time. We need to do better next time. Now, Dr. Odubanjo, you're part of a panel tomorrow that will be looking at Nigeria's response to the pandemic. Why uh, is it important for Nigeria to review its response at this time? Well, because if you, if you don't look at what you did right and perhaps what you did wrong, uh, the next time something hits you, you're going to make the same mistakes you made before and uh, you might also even have forgotten the things you did right. 
and, and start from scratch. So where you should be starting from five or three or two, you're starting from zero, you know, because you've basically forgotten what you did. And I'll put that in perspective, you know, by saying that um, in 2014, we had the Ebola outbreak. So when this happened last year, people were I had a few conversations on the side, private sector, government, and people said, oh, you know what, uh, things are really going to get better now because everybody now realizes the importance of health. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm a skeptic because I was right in the middle of 2014 Ebola outbreak in Lagos and Port Harcourt eventually, or primarily Lagos. And I saw the same reaction. I saw the same panic. I saw the same concern about health care coming from everybody. Uh, and I saw it all disappear in 93 days <laughs> when we said Ebola was over in Nigeria. I saw how everything went back to normal. So um, it's important to sit back. And when this started actually last year, I also did tell some people, I said, we're starting from zero. And that is wrong because there are certain things we did then, but it looks like they've been forgotten. Uh, there are people that worked then who know what to do now uh, and, and they've sworn not to work for Nigeria anymore. You know, and those are the things that we must deal with. We must correct them. We must ensure that we never get back to zero. We must always be building on the past successes and ensure that we do better easily or more easily next time. Mm. Next time, lessons learned. Well, Dr. Doina, should uh, another pandemic, you know, break out, uh, heavens forbid, though, uh, how prepared would you say Nigeria is? Uh, not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I would simply pray for you and say, may you not see another pandemic. Uh, that's my real prayer for you. Uh, on, on, a, on a serious note, um, in the midst of a pandemic, we've seen how many health workers strikes. Um, We've seen health worker migration increase. Uh, we've seen that things are still dilapidated. Uh, that tells us that we are getting worse and we're still in the middle of the pandemic. So how do you, in the middle of the pandemic, have health workers striking because they're not being paid? In fact, some of those who worked on the pandemic and in isolation centers are now complaining and doing interviews and, and telling us they were not paid. Uh, so. All of those things tell us that we're in trouble and tells us that we are not prepared for the next one. Okay, because it means that the people who volunteer to do it now, they didn't know what, 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 what was waiting for them. If you went to work in an isolation center months ago, you didn't know if you were going to die. You didn't know if your family was going to get it because of you. And they took those risks. Now, next time, they are not going to do it because they feel they, they were not treated fairly. The contract was not adhered to. And then, I mean, we've seen all kinds of things that we should not be seeing, at least not right. now. We may see them when the pandemic right, is right. over, but we will be seeing them right. now. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to this event. I know we all are. You can catch this, this event on our social media stream tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Thank you so much, Dr. Doi Odunkoya, for joining us this morning on Breakfast Central. Banjo. Thank you very much. Do Banjo. Banjo. Thank Banjo, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, still to come on Breakfast Central today. about Euro 2020, England, banning knockout old first Germany. We'll tell you how. Well, you are still watching Breakfast Central on News Central. From music to movies and lots more, here's uh, some entertainment scoop with none other than Samuel Ojo, a.k.a. Sam Dandy. Sam, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Olisa. Well, morning. there's a lot to get to, of course, in entertainment. Now, let me start with this story, right? So, Tanzanian singer and the CEO of Condé Music Worldwide, Harmonize, has been subjected to some major setback after his brand new song, Sanda Kalawe, was pulled down from YouTube. Now, sources say the song was deleted from the streaming platform over a copyright strike filed by Empire, of course, for using unauthorized content. Now, and I quote, when you look at the video, it says, the video contains content from Empire, who has blocked it in your country on copyright grounds. And that's what it says on YouTube. Now, the song disappeared on YouTube at the time it was trending at number 25 with over 650,000 views. But this is not the first time this is happening for Harmonize, let's be honest, right? So in November 2019, this was the first occasion, the song You Know was pulled down from, uh, of course, from 
from him. And of course, it was also for a copyright strike. Now, at the particular time, Engar argued that Conde Boy had sampled his work, you know, without permission. Now, in fact, just in March this year, Harmonize's album, the entire album, Afro East, was also pulled down from YouTube and other streaming platforms now over copyright claims. Now, the album was later re-uploaded on YouTube, minus two songs. Now, Your Body featuring Burner Boy and Malaika featuring Morgan Heritage. Now, of course, still due to copyright issues. I think you should sort this out because, I mean, back to back. Well, let's move from that now to film. So the 2020 Nigerian film produced by Martin Bados, A Soldier's Story 2, has just become the first Nigerian film to get distributed by American distribution company Lionsgate. Now, the company acquired the Frankie Olga-directed film for video on demand and television distribution in North America. Now, confirming the news or the milestone, uh, of course, the director himself took to social media to say, a soldier's story to producer. Um, he wrote this, he said, we are global now. This, the feeling that we have when Lionsgate Studio is distributing your movie, you know, across America and Canada. So we didn't know that until he put that out. He said, um, of course, and the film stars, uh, Nollywood stars, in fact, Hollywood stars Eric Roberts and then Hollywood stars like Sum Kelly Yala and Daniel K. Daniel and, you know, just to mention a few. Now, the 2020 sequel follows the intriguing story of a post-war violence in the fictional Watts Republic. Now, the story also systematically explores political themes and, interestingly, the role of foreign interventions play in African crisis. Now, um, it first premiered in 2018 and, uh, you know, it got a couple of awards at that time. So, yeah. We're looking forward to how far it's going to go and what Americans or Canadians or perhaps, you know, Nigerians and diaspora would think about this. Now, finally, to my last story on this one. So, Rexy, the producer, has dropped a new album. Now, you know, he's responsible for songs like, you know, Zanku, Naramali, Sopi, Teshumole. And in fact, the monster song, the monster hit, let me call it KPK. Now, the 26-year-old album also comes after his Grammy certificate for Burner Boy's Twice as Tall. Now, I don't think most people knew that he actually got a certificate for his contribution on that album. Now, with a total of 17 tracks, the album boasts new, new raves like Oxlade, Midas, The Jagaban, Bella Shmurda, Bad Boy Teams, Buju, um, Zino Liski, T-Classic, Lighter, I mean, it's really packed. And that's not all. There's also South African rapper Shoma Josie. I love her. Uh, Award-winning Ghanaian rapper Sakodie. And then there's still heavyweights like Davido and Tenny on this album. I'm talking 17 songs, you know, features back to back, side by side. And I, I, I'm just, I'm excited for him. I, I think people will start to see, you know, more of what he can do. Wow, thank mm. you so much, Sam, for the Juicy and Simmons series you've given us this morning. I'm looking forward to that movie, Soldier Boy 2. I need I'm to see it. Really? He just told us that Rexy's got an uh, album. Uh, the guy that did uh, KPK, Kokwake. Right, you know, right. You know, I mean. we're, we're still reeling from that from, from last year. But thank you very much, Sam, for Anytime. the latest in entertainment. Right, you're still watching Breakfast Central. Let's go straight to some uh, sporting news uh, right now. Well, where do we start? Uh, all about England and Wembley yesterday. They knocked out their old first Germany uh, by two. Goes to nothing last night. All about that man there. Yes, uh, Raheem Sterling, he scored his third goal in this tournament. Uh, not the bad one. And uh, Harry Kane, the captain, also scored his second. A great cross from Jack Grayley. She came up from the bench to make it two goals to nothing against England. Who were the dominant side? There was a big miss from that man there, uh, though, talking about... Uh, uh, Thomas Muller could have been 1-1 one -one at some point, but he missed that. It was quite a surprising one. And we saw a big battle in midfield, but England turned up. And at Wembley, they had uh, over 40,000 fans yesterday. So it was quite very English and very loud uh, there. So it means England uh, knock out Germany for the first time in the competition uh, since 1966. So it's uh, quite an old one for them, so not bad. Which means they'll be facing Ukraine. Now let's talk about Ukraine themselves. The Ukrainians... Well, had no problems, though they hopped and puffed against uh, Sweden. They won that one 2 1 in extra time. Alexander Zichenko uh, scoring the first goal uh, for them uh, in that one. And we also saw Emil Fersberg getting an equalizer. Not a bad one. He also hit the woodwork three times in that match. So he was an unlucky man, uh, Emil Fersberg. And, uh, but that substitute there, Dubrev uh, scoring the goal for Ukraine to make it two goals to one, which means they'll be facing England in the quarterfinals on. Uh, Saturday, so England versus Ukraine. I really wonder, you know, how to separate these two sides. But England look like they might be favourites. Well, uh, joining me this morning is none other than Udoka Njoku, our very own from the sports desk. Well, uh, Udoka, morning to you. It looks like maybe, perhaps it's coming home, or is it not? For no, England? it's not. It's not coming home. Maybe for Germany, they saw some Dorime yesterday <laughs> in that game against against England. But of course, England got their first knockout win in a very long time and a sweet revenge against the Germans. And uh, for Germany, we know that this is the last time we'll get to see Joachim Löw talking about the German coach be the manager right there. We know that from next season, we'll be seeing Hansi Flick take over the role, uh, the managerial role 
And I'm also so sorry to see the likes of Thomas Muller. This is actually his last tournament. Mm. Uh, we'll be seeing a different German team the next time. But congratulations to England and Harry Kane for scoring his first goal in the tournament. Highest goal score so far, uh, high, highest goal scorer so far has to be Ryan Sterling. But good one for uh, England knocking out Germany. Uh, you mean for England, the top scorer in the remain. tournament? Three goals. <laughs> Ronaldo's got five and he's, you know, he's been sent back uh, packing. Yeah. All right, uh, let's talk about some tennis. Uh, mm. Good news uh, for Africa, perspectively. Uh, Ons Jabor, she was, uh, we saw her yesterday on court, a victory mm -hmm. over Rebecca, uh, you know, Robert Patterson of Sweden. So uh, she's suited to the next round. She's, mm -hmm. she's so confident this time, uh, Ons Jabor. Yeah, true. And uh, she also hopes to make it to the semi final. So it looks like she's very confident, knowing that she, she's coming up from a sweet victory. She just won a title, her first title, making her the first Arabian, uh, the first uh, African, also to win a major title when it comes to the world of tennis. So heading into where Wimbledon, she's also very confident, beating opponents left, right, and center. And she also still hopes to make it to the semi finals, even the finals of the Wembley this time around. Uh, looking forward to that one. But congratulations to the Tunisian, congratulations to Africa. But I'm right. sad to see Serena Williams. I know you would want to talk about that yeah, one. Yeah, another so for on Jabba Serena. will face uh, Venus Williams, but let's talk about Serena quickly. Mm -hmm. He ended in tears, right? Yeah, ended in tears and uh, a sad one. I mean, for Serena, personally, I think she should just call, call time out for uh, on the game of tennis because she's trying to get her 24th Grand Slam title and it's not working for her from injuries to her being beaten and uh, to her withdrawing from tournaments. It doesn't speak well of Serena. Leave while the ovation is still loud. For me, I think she should just take time off the game. All right, thank you very much, Udoka. Sad one for Serena Williams. She slipped and couldn't finish that match. She walked out injured, which means she's no longer at Wimbledon. I don't think she's retiring. Maybe we'll see her once again when it comes <laughs> to uh, the uh, US Open. All right, right we'll see how that her. turns out for her. All right, thank you very much, Udoka. I will catch yeah. you much later. And that's it uh, on Sports uh, Ology. Hey, all right, now looking at sports and um, Predictions, predictions. Mm. I know you have some predictions. Please. What I can predict is what you can watch later today <laughs> on News Central. All right, so let's check out what you can watch later on the station. In the game at 10.30 a.m. with Tudoka. And 5.30 p.m. West African time, we have East Central. And at 9 p.m. tonight, I can predict this one, <laughs> NC Continental Prime, all the news and everything on the day's wrap-up right here on News Central. Another right. prediction is that we are leaving right now. <laughs> yes, and also in addition to that prediction, today is a very particular day, especially yeah. in the social media space. Mm. Now, June 30th um, is celebrated as World Social Media Day to highlight mm. how it has emerged and how it has been important to us all. Okay, so. World Social Media Day. Will I get a surprise package that I can finally use Twitter? <laughs> Up to the federal government. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tomorrow. Thank I you very know. much for watching. <laughs>